The Catholic Men's Podcast, helping you find good works of literature for the Catholic gentleman. Reading Vatican Pimpernel by Lieutenant Colonel Sam Derry with David McDonald. In Rome, long after the end of the Second World War, my wife and I crossed the vast expanse of St. Peter's Square to the top steps of the Basilica. Right here, I said, he used to wait for us. So often during the German occupation of 1943 to 44, I saw Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty standing there large as life, over six feet in height with a rugged Irish face bent over a breviary, glasses glinting on his big nose, he'd look over the square for a familiar figure, one of our agents, while murmuring Latin and a carry brogue. To sightseeing Wehrmacht soldiers, he was just another priest at prayer. Nothing about him suggested that this was the Vatican Pimpernel, up to his clerical collar and wartime intrigue. As a theologian for the Holy See, Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty officially dealt in Catholic dogma. Ex officio, he led the underground British organization in Rome, which saved almost 4,000 runaway Allied prisoners of war from the Germans. The key to its amazing success lay in Monsignor O'Flaherty's makeup. Besides awesome courage, sharp wits, and the impish ways of an oversized leprechaun, he had more compassion than anyone I've ever known. We met when I was 29, a British Army major captured by Rommel's Africa Corps and held in Italy for 15 months. I jumped off a POW train in October 1943 and landed with a partisan farmer less than 15 miles from Rome. Since several Allied envoys were still inside the neutral Vatican, a village priest agreed to take a note there for anybody English. Back came money and a summons to Rome from someone he called my superior. Dressed as a laborer and smuggled into Rome under a cartload of cabbages, I was eventually led to the Vatican by a courier named Aldo. A burly man in black gazed down from the basilica's left-hand steps, muttering, follow me. He bustled through the Bernini colonnades, up an alley into a building marked Collegio Teutonico, the German college, outside the Vatican but still on neutral ground. Escorting me into a small bedroom study, he said with a twinkle, Make yourself at home. My name's O'Flaherty and I live here. But why was I here? The 45-year-old priest grinned mischievously. You'll soon find out, he said. Meanwhile, how would you like a nice warm bath? I must say I wasted no time in accepting. At dusk, both clad in cassocks, we bluffed our way past the Swiss guards and jackbooted Germans to the Vatican's nearby Aspizio de Santa Maria, the home of the refugee British legation. Our minister there, Sir Darcy Osborne, told me about Hugh O'Flaherty. As a young seminarian from Ireland, he'd been posted to Rome in 1922, the year Mussolini's dictatorship began. A Vatican Monsignor by 1934, he was deeply devoted to golf and assorted good works. In the early war years, he used to tour Italian POW camps, seeking out new prisoners still missing in action and reassuring their families whenever possible via Vatican radio as to their physical condition. After the Allied forces' landings and Italy's capitulation in September 1943, thousands of POWs, mostly Britons, were let loose and many reached Rome, just as German troops seized it. Recalling O'Flaherty, the ex-prisoners turned to him for help and advice. He hid hundreds with Roman friends or with rural partisans, meanwhile scrounging money to support them. But now, Sir Darcy related, an officer was needed to lend a hand. And that's why I was sent for you, Sir Darcy told me. Are you prepared to take the command? Fascinated by O'Flaherty, I readily agreed. He decided we'd share his room at the Collegio. To the Monsignor's mind, now devious, now direct, always unpredictable, a British conspirator should be safest in a place filled with German clergy. So he let me sleep on his sofa, obtained a civilian suit for me, and produced identity cards converting me from Sam to Patrick Derry, and from an Anglican to a Dublin-born Catholic employed by Holy Mother Church. Tramping around Rome with him, I marveled at how his organization had so far concealed more than a thousand XPOWs in convents, in crowded apartments, on outlying farms. His favorite such billet was an apartment directly behind SS headquarters. Fifth, he chortled, they'll not look under their noses. 
Given the tacit blessing of Pope Pius XII, the Monsignor secured aid from an odd collection of monks, nuns, communists, nobles, a Swiss count, two free French secret agents, and a cockney butler, John May, at our UK legation. As John put it, Our Irish friend knows everyone, and they all adore him. A notable exception was SS Colonel Herbert Kapler, chief of SS forces in Rome. He learned of an escape line run by a mysterious priest, and, unknown to us, had Gestapo men scheming to catch him. The colonel almost succeeded. Once, when the Monsignor called on Prince Filippo Doria Pamphili, a prominent anti-fascist who backed the network with money, Kapler raided the Palazzo Doria. As rifle butts banged on the front door, O'Flaherty fled to the cellar, where sacks of coal were just then tumbling through a trap door. He quickly stripped to trousers and a t-shirt, stuffing his cassock and clerical hat into one bag. Smeared with soot, he crept out behind the delivery truck, shuffled past a score of SS officers, and vanished before they could realize that the coalman carried a full sack away. As chief of staff to this artful dodger, I ordered all our escapes to stay under cover lest they compromise the Italian padroni, patrons, who courted death by harboring them. Yet the greatest security problems were posed by the Monsignor himself. He delighted in deliberately flirting with danger. After we'd long kept a British general cooped up in a secret room, O'Flaherty took that star boarder garbed in Donegal tweeds to a papal reception and introduced him as an Irish doctor to the German ambassador. I was furious. Ah, now, he said, winking. "'Twas a nice break for him. As POWs turned up, the Monsignor usually guided them to their secret billets or cells, often in clerical robes, because he couldn't bear asking anyone else to run the risk. But early in 1944, with the Allied armies pinned down below Monte Cassino, about a hundred miles away, O'Flaherty himself was compelled to take cover. First, an escape in one of our rural billets was recaptured. Threatened with torture, he turned in twelve other POWs and their padroni, O'Flaherty's reaction was typical, a gentle, God forgive him. I couldn't. A further betrayal led the SS to 16 more POWs in two Rome hideouts where the Monsignor and I were known. Some were shot. The German ambassador then informed O'Flaherty that he'd been denounced to Colonel Kapler as the escape line's leader. If you ever step outside the Vatican, you will be arrested, he warned. Under pressure from German authorities, his church superiors also ordered him to stay put and to put his guest out of his rooms. So I covertly moved into the British legation, carrying on our clandestine business as before. Undeterred, the Monsignor met our agents openly on St. Peter's steps. One day, a former helper named Grossi brought word of an injured POW in a village 30 miles from Rome. Without telling me, the Monsignor promised to go there the next Sunday. A last-minute message from another agent saved his life. Grossi had sold out to Colonel Kapler, who'd baited a diabolical trap for O'Flaherty by playing on his known Samaritan sympathies. The Allies finally broke through at Monte Cassino on May 18th and swept toward Rome. When the city awoke on June 4th, the Grey Hordes were gone, retreating north as Allied troops rolled into the Eternal City to a tumultuous welcome. While some 250,000 people massed in St. Peter's Square for the Pope's benediction, I went looking for Monsignor O'Flaherty. He was in the German college giving thanks to God. In nine months, Monsignor O'Flaherty's makeshift organization had taken care of 3,925 escapees, including 1,695 Britons. In all, 122 men were recaptured and half a dozen shot. Yet, O'Flaherty couldn't stop there. Overnight, his boundless compassion embraced our foes as well. When U.S. General Mark Clark came to pay his respects, O'Flaherty quizzed him sharply to make sure that German prisoners were well treated. In a plane lent by the Allied Commander-in-Chief, General Sir Harold Alexander, the Monsignor, flew to see thousands of Italian POWs in South Africa and then visited Jewish refugees in Jerusalem. He was awarded a CBE, Commander of the British Empire, the U.S. Medal of Freedom with Silver Palm, and other decorations from Canada and Australia, but when Italy's first post-war government awarded him a lifetime pension, he never accepted one lira of it. 
he wanted nothing for himself. While I stayed in Rome, arranging repayments to all those who supported O'Flaherty's network or otherwise aided the Allies, many fascist collaborators came to trial. Among them were two double agents, a doctor who'd rented one of our hideouts and the courier Aldo who'd first taken me to the Vatican. Incapable of spite, the Monsignor testified on their behalf. They did wrong, he admitted, but there's good in every man. He sincerely believed it. After SS Colonel Kapler was jailed for life as a war criminal, O'Flaherty often went to visit him. To me, Kapler said, he became a fatherly friend. And when Colonel Kapler later entered the Catholic Church, he was baptized by Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty. Although seldom together following the war, the Monsignor and I kept in close touch. Made notary of the Holy Office, he remained at the Vatican until 1960, when he suffered a stroke and retired to his sister's home in County Kerry. Three years later, I was maneuvered into a London television studio, the unwitting subject of This Is Your Life. Before an audience of former POWs, colleagues from the British organization in Rome came forth to share old memories. A white-haired Monsignor O'Flaherty appeared on film, sending greetings from Ireland in a halting, quavery voice, because, it was explained, his doctors had warned him not to travel. But suddenly the Monsignor appeared and walked slowly out on stage. Blinking in the limelight, he grinned and threw his arms around me. We both wept for joy. That was our last time together. Within months, he died peacefully at 65, after a good life that another priest summed up in these few true words. Hugh O'Flaherty was above all a generous, honest-to-God Irishman. His big heart was open to any and every distress. Well, since we're in the spirit of escapes during World War II, I want to read another story called Breakout. It's from the same book that I got the Vatican Pimpernel from, True Stories of Great Escapes, compiled by Reader's Digest. I actually haven't read this one yet, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be good. That way we can both be surprised when we're reading it. So here we go. Breakout by Kristen List Hansen. The first of that day's series of improbable events occurred when a key grated in the lock of my tiny attic cell. The solid wooden door creaked open, and there stood the chief of the Nazi prison guards, Trappart himself. Get your things together, he said. You're leaving. Leaving? I couldn't believe it. For four long months, I had been a prisoner on the sixth floor of this sprawling, U-shaped building, once the Copenhagen offices of the Shell Petroleum Company, but now Danish headquarters of the German Gestapo. I shared the prison with 35 other Danish resistance leaders, and I had feared that I'd never leave the place alive. We are sending you to Froslev concentration camp, Trappart said. The car will be leaving in 15 minutes. The door clicked shut, and he was gone. Incredulously, I glanced at my watch. It was 8.10 a.m., on March 21st, 1945. For just a moment, my future seemed immeasurably brighter. I knew Froslev to be an easy camp. My chances of survival there would be much better than where I was. Though I had once organized a Danish underground police force, the Gestapo had apparently come to consider me too unimportant to remain in Shell House Attic, where they kept only those leaders suspected of being most dangerous to them. They were much more interested now in interrogating Danes who had masterminded the sabotage of German-run war factories and railways. Naturally, I was glad to be getting out of that infamous building, but I felt a sharp pang of regret at leaving so many of my friends behind to die. From the interrogation room on the fifth floor just below, I could hear the cries of fellow Danes undergoing questioning. More and more of our group were being arrested every day, and many of them were being forced to talk. Consequently, the Gestapo's massive intelligence files, kept on the first three floors, were fast nearing completion. Soon, the Nazis would finish piecing together their complex jigsaw puzzle of information. Then, most of my friends in the attic would be shot, or put to slower deaths. Worse, when the Gestapo's files were completed, scores of other Danish resistance leaders would be arrested and executed. 
our whole regional underground movement would be defeated. 8.30 a.m. The surly German guard named Weismer marched me across the corridor to the washroom for the last time. As we went in, Professor Paul Brandt Rockberg came limping out, and I was shocked to see how badly crippled he was from Gestapo beatings. This eminent Danish physiologist, who had helped most of Denmark's 7,000 Jews to safety, was now paying a heartbreaking price for his valor. On the way back to my cell, I caught a glimpse of young Paul Brunn, who had planned many acts of sabotage. We had all heard whispers of his impending fate. We've found out you have been lying to us, an SS officer had informed him the evening before. Tomorrow you will tell us the whole story, if we have to tear it from you. For the slightly built gentle Brunn, it was now tomorrow. Again, conscience stabbed me. What right did I have to escape? when men who had done so much more for our cause and country would stay here and perish. 8.40 a.m. Back in my cell, I listened to the rising moan of the wind. It would be gray and raw outside, no weather for flying. They won't come today, I thought, and was forced to smile grimly at the wild fantasies that desperation can bring to the mind. There was no sensible reason to believe they would ever come. As long as we've got you up here under the roof... Our jailers had always reminded us, Your Arya friends will never attack. They know you'd be the first ones killed by their bombs. Besides, your allied friends are too busy in Europe to be interested in a cause as trivial as yours. They've forgotten you. Discouragingly logical arguments. Yet drowning men clutch at straws, and we prisoners in the attic had long clung to a last forlorn hope. If, we reasoned, our resistance leaders outside should determine that Shell House must be destroyed at any cost, if they could prevail on the Royal Air Force to attempt the job, and if the pilots could single out our building in a crowded district where all the steep-tiled rooftops looked alike, then the damning records in Shell House might be destroyed, and our underground movement saved, and the terrible ordeal might be quickly over for us expendable prisoners locked up in the attic. 8.55 a.m. The poker-faced Weissner and two other soldiers came to escort me out of the building. As we passed the second and first floors, I glimpsed the vast rows of filing cabinets filled with the incriminating records that threatened to doom my comrades. How I longed for a hand grenade. We reached the door landing outside, but there Weissner stopped and swore furiously, "'The morning car is already gone!' Now we'll have to wait until one o'clock for the next one. So it was back to the attic at 9.02. I attached no significance to the delay, nor to the fact that I was now placed not in my old cell, number 10, but in number 6. What did a few more hours matter when, without even a word of farewell, I'd soon be leaving my friends forever? I kept glancing at the hands of my watch, slowly edging towards my departure time. Ten o'clock came. Eleven... 11.15. Little did I know that the long-hoped-for impossible air attack was almost upon us, and that using the bad weather as an element of surprise, 46 Allied planes, 18 Mosquito bombers, and 28 Mustang fighters were streaking for their target. Shell House. 11.18 a.m. At the whine of diving planes, I jumped up. As the bombs hit Shell House, the attic floor heaved violently beneath my feet, Dust filled the air, making it difficult to see or breathe, and everything loose in the cell whirled around me. This, I realized, was only the salvo from the first wave of bombers. Could they destroy the records just thirty feet below without destroying us too? I picked up my wooden stool and hurled it against the cell door. To my amazement, the panel shattered. Rushing into the corridor, I saw Weismer blocking my path. I grabbed him by the shoulders and shook him violently. The keys! I roared at him. I was frantic. Give me the keys to the cells! Hurry up! Weismer, however, was paralyzed with terror, and for a second we both stared in awe at the gaping hole that a bomb had torn in the roof. Planes roared unbelievably overhead. Machine guns stuttered and flicked red tongues. Bombs crashed all around us. I could hear the other prisoners beating away at their doors. The keys! I screamed at Weismer again. Slowly, he began to pull a chain from his pocket. I snatched it from him and began unlocking the cell doors. Here was my big chance. 
the one I'd thought never would come. But would there be time? In seconds, I unlocked cells 7, 8, and 9. Number 10, my old cell, was open and empty. As I rushed toward number 11, the whole building reeled and shook with a new series of explosions. But I managed to reach an open 11 and 12, and as a sheet of flame from the ruined west wing swept toward me, 13, 14, and 15. Rushing out of their cells into the dust-choked corridor came leading figures of the Danish resistance. Some, like Professor Brandt, Reichberg, were limping so badly from interrogations that they could barely walk. But we were out. Every one of us from the attic's south wing was free. Some of us ran to help prisoners in the west wing, but found them impossible to reach. A bomb had ripped a gigantic hole in the floor, and we couldn't get across. With the others behind me, I raced for the northeast stairs. A lucky choice. They proved to be one of the only two stairways in the building still left standing. The few prisoners still alive in the blazing west wing were making even more spectacular exits. Paul Brunn, experiencing an even rougher day than had been promised him by the Gestapo, had fallen straight through to the fifth floor. His skull was fractured, but he was vaguely aware of a fire surging toward him. It was either jump from a fifth-story window, or burned to death. Brun jumped. Spinning down, he landed in a tangle of barbed wire. Meanwhile, our group raced down the stairs and burst into the open. There had been no time to think of the guards and guns that might await us there, but a glance revealed only corpses. The lucky guards had fled. The gate of the barbed wire fence was standing open. We ran through it, wildly, headlong. By another freak of chance, the barbed wire entanglement, our last obstruction, had been blown to bits, and a path was cleared for us precisely where and when we needed it. The streets were mercifully deserted and filled with smoke. By now, practically everyone else had dived into the air raid shelters. Among them, I learned later, my wife and 15-year-old son, who had watched the bombing from a shop not 700 yards away. For a moment, we seemed to have the entire city to ourselves. Only when the last ground-shaking explosions ended did we turn to look back. Shell House Attic, about 90 seconds after we left it, had collapsed in a torrent of flames. We quickly scattered in various directions, and in seven minutes, I had reached a friend's house. That evening, I learned more about the air raid, one of the most daring and perilous of the war. Launched in cooperation with the Danish resistance, the mission had been led by Britain's Air Vice Marshal Sir Basil Embry himself. The bombing attack on Shell House had cost four RAF bombers, two fighter planes, and the lives of nine of the airmen. But the assault had accomplished its mission. Though eight of the attic prisoners had died, the incriminating Gestapo records lay in ashes. Scores, perhaps even hundreds, of Copenhagen resistance fighters had thus been placed beyond the reach of terror. For us, and for our families and friends, it was a night for exuberant, if incredulous, celebration. Gosh, that ended up being pretty interesting. I'm actually really glad I read that one. And I'm sure y'all got a kick out of it, too. Before I sign off, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's been so generous this week. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening, and we have a lot of really good shows lined up for this summer. Godspeed.